Okay. Um, I just wanted to let you know that um, this is something that's really exciting. Um, Polly Higgins is an advocate for the planet. And I'm not going to uh, do a full intro on her because I would like you, Polly, to describe your work because only you know you can do it best. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Okay, yeah. go. <laughs> um, well, good evening, everyone. Our absolute delight to have the opportunity to join you like this. Um, Weirdly, I'm seeing myself, so I'm not seeing you guys, but... on ecocide law, which is not yet in place as an international crime, but that's what I'm devoting my life to doing, and uh, that's my mission, I, to align the force of law, if you like, to the force of life, and to really bring in, put in place a law to protect all life, not just human life, but also the life of all beings, human and non-human, on this earth, and the life of earth itself. In practical terms, what that means is to criminalize ecocide, um, make it mass destruction of the earth uh, a crime. I'll give you one example. Um, it, would, it, it would criminalize dangerous industrial activity such as glyphosate, neonicotinoids, um, Roundup. There you go. Uh, the sorts of uh, industries that inevitably harm our bees, and not just our bees, but our whole ecosystems, um, not just our food, but actually how we actually interact with the earth itself through the way we connect with it. I, it's, it's a big job. Uh, the Netherlands is a very important country for me, as you can imagine, uh, because the International Criminal Court is based in The Hague. I spend a fair amount of time coming and going from the Netherlands. I'm very sorry that I can't actually be with you tonight. I, but from what I've heard, it sounds as if it's very exciting. And um, yeah, I, I hope you're surrounded by happy bees, <laughs> knowing that you are really um, bee protectors and natural beekeeping is, of course, the future. And um, each and every one of you is a pioneer in that space. So it, it's great to be with you this evening. I'm not actually terribly sure how long I'm allowed to talk to you. To you. So, so Polly. I'm going to pass this back to Terry okay. and say. Can I just ask you a question? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? OK, so if this was Christmas and you could have anything you wanted, <laughs> that law, how would it unfold uh, in terms of liability for the crimes? Like, who would be responsible in ecocide law? Who would be held accountable? Yeah, so this is all about accountability. And in fact, the phrase used here is the responsibility to protect. So it's looking at, um, because it's criminal law, it holds individuals to account. Unlike civil litigation, where, as I'm sure you understand, you can sue a company, you can chase them through the courts, it can take many, many years, and if a company is found uh, to be held to account through a civil court, then it's maybe a fine that's paid, but it doesn't stop the company from doing what it's doing, because often what they're doing is not a crime. With criminal law, what it does is it holds persons to account, individuals. So then you're looking at CEOs, directors, and indeed it's also to do with the, what the principle is known as the principle of superior responsibility. So it's also about governments, it's about ministers, it's about heads of state, it's holding them personally to account because they are in superior positions of responsibility for the decisions that are made that either lead to serious damage, destruction to a loss of ecosystems, or decisions that sidestep, avoid them from taking the responsibility that's required to prevent it from happening. So uh, my Christmas wish, 
Uh, well, my Christmas wish actually does tie in very much with December because December is a very important time in the calendar every year for the International Criminal Court. Uh, the Assembly of State Parties is held every year and in, indeed this December it's being held in The Hague. Every second and third year it's held in The Hague. Uh, every first year it's held in New York. And so I'm going to be back there this, this year. I, what I want this Christmas is to be able to come away from the Assembly of, uh, of State Parties in The Hague thinking, yep, we're really moving forward here. Um, I'll be taking a bigger team there. We're going to hopefully do something that's really quite ambitious this year, which will really take this quite far. Uh, every year I'm going back with a bigger team. Now we have a campaign, Mission Life Force, where we're inviting people to sign up as earth protectors to help fund take this law forward. It's a kind of legally pegged crowdfund, if you like. Do you, so have, do you, have, like that, the, do you have the website? Can you hold up, like, do you have something? Do you know what? I, I forgot to do this. Mission Life Force. MissionLifeForce.com? Dot org. Okay, right. Okay. Organization. Yeah. <laughs> MissionLifeForce.org. So my great wish is that many, many people, millions of people will sign up to be earth protectors mm -hmm. in law and help us fund taking forward of ecocide law into the International Criminal Court. This is ultimately, it, it's civil society that will drive this law forward. Most laws that are put in place are put in place through the huge financial lobbying of big transnational corporations. So let's flip that model. Let's, why don't Perfect. we put in place the law that we require for the earth to speak on, give voice on behalf of the earth and behalf of the bees, behalf of all creatures and say this is a law that will protect us all. Perfect. Oh, okay. I wish you wings. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to do a presentation. I'm going to abbreviate it of what I've been doing. So I'm going next after you. And then we're going to have a series of other people as well. What we want to do is really encourage people here to participate, ask questions, let me finish my spiel because I'm nervous um, and I, I, I'll get off course and I haven't done it yet. I haven't done my, my slideshow yet. But um, mm -hmm. I promise lots of flowers, <laughs> lots of flower <laughs> images. And then do you want to just hang on and, and yeah. join? Okay, because we want to ask you questions at the end. So um, I'll just go ahead and start. Can you plug in my uh, thingy? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Polly. You're awesome. Can we applaud you? Yes. <laughs> this stuff all the time. I think about insects, I think about bees. I started as a beekeeper and quickly evolved, and I'm sure you are too, to include the entire pollinator system of the planet because what you do for a pollinator, like a bumblebee and a butterfly, you're doing for the honeybee. The important pollinators are the ones that don't have a voice, the ones that we we know about, we care about, but they don't have the legal voice that honeybees do. And I ask myself, like, how, how in the world did we get to right here? I look out the window, I don't see the life. And I'm older, I remember, I remember butterflies. I remember skies dark with butterflies. When I, I remember I was in the 70s, I was at a concert, an outdoor concert, and the sun went out. Nothing, it was dark immediately. And you looked up and it was a flock of monarch butterflies that lasted so long, the band stopped playing and everyone looked. And when they were finally passed, everybody applauded. It was like the best, it was the most amazing experience. That's what it's supposed to be like. How did we get to 75% loss of biomass? And that's not the worst of the numbers. That biomass means just the food of the, the, for the birds that are also depleting. People are talking about the lack of insects smeared on their windshields. That used to be a thing that we all experienced. 
and it's just not there anymore. But the thing that confuses me the most, or used to confuse me the most, is how did this happen without a massive cry, without anyone calling it a crisis, with us normalizing it, which is what we've done. We've created a new normal that doesn't include a whole lot of very important, much more important species, because they're gonna do fine when we're gone, but we're not doing well with them leaving. And they're, they're going faster than we can even imagine. Um, and that doesn't even speak to the other things that are not sexy, like honeybees. It doesn't speak to microbes in the soil. It doesn't speak to the insect life in ponds. It doesn't speak to the amphibians, the lizards, all of those important species. Because what we are doing with our agriculture system is criminal. It is only concerned about making profits for a very, very few at the expense of our land, of our water, of our soil, and of our insects, our natural resources. I always wonder, how did this happen? How, how is it that, that this kind of massive abuse of power could even happen? And I just think about it, you know, I had a really troubled childhood, so this is a question that I ponder at different times. Like, how does abuse become okay and normal? And I'm telling you, it takes a village. There is only one way for something, this kind of crime, this kind of magnitude of what we've done to our planet to occur. And it took a lot of people. It took a whole bunch of people. It took a whole bunch of industry. It took a bunch of lobbyists. It took a bunch of chemical makers. It took a, a global, a global um, corporate entity of chemical manufacturers saying that we need to grow food in poison. We've normalized that. And it doesn't make any sense at all. You can take all the science, you can dissect it, you can, you can do all the stats, you can give it all these uh, studies, you can give it more importance by giving it more research, you can build buildings for the might, might buildings, might institutions, and you're still gonna come right down to here that our food is grown in poison and it makes zero sense. So that's what I struggle with. That's the kind of things that make me understand that the only way that something like this can even occur is through massive cooperation of a lot of people. And honeybees are a voice. They're a portal. They've, oh, the door is open to a lot of people because we connect to honeybees. We're a selfish species. When we think about about bees, what we're really thinking about is us and our food. And what happens is, because we are such a selfish species, we, um, we connect to an insect that feeds us. But the rest of the insects have no voice. They have no such love. We've reduced them to pests. And how do you get rid of something? You, you invalidate it. You call it a pest, it's a, and then create the pesticide to kill it. And this is what we've done. We've invalidated an entire life system of this planet that is as important as air and water. This is what we've done by voting with our fork three times a day to eat poison. Because if we're doing it, they're doing it. And again, we're not gonna make it if they don't. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to this. Okay, how can you talk about, how can we talk about bees so much and so much study, so much research, so much information, so much money poured into the problem of bees and still be avoiding the topic of pesticides. It's because the pesticide industry controls the narrative. They control what we as beekeepers think about. And there are so many good conventional beekeepers. I know a lot of people who have lost everything to try and keep their bees alive. So broad brush, but commercial beekeeping is really a problem. It holds the narrative, and the general public believes that whatever the chemical bee, I'm sorry, the conventional beekeeping, beekeeping industry says, they believe that that applies to pollinator systems, and that's not the truth. It applies to a highly managed insect that we put in boxes on the ground, nowhere near where they want to live. We get them to hobble along, um, dousing them with chemicals, chemicals, acids, fogs, antibiotics, and then we feed, we take away their nutrition, and we give it, we give them sugar replacement, 
We give them artificial pollen because the pollen in the flowers is poison. So the whole system is, is rigged. It's like our elections. There's no way. <laughs> it's, it's rigged. It doesn't work. It serves a few at the expense of almost everyone, everything. So, okay, I'm in San Francisco. I think about things in terms of how can I make it the how can I make my effort the most efficient? I live in a in a in a pollen and nectar desert. I, I keep honeybees, but what I really do is I support pollinators. I don't take their food, I sell a tiny bit. I've been beekeeping since two, 2008, the first time I made any money, which well, I'll never recoup the cost, you all know that. Um, the first time I made any money was uh, 2017, so I don't do it for honey, and I just wanted to get that out of the way, because I'm, I'm not in it for that. Um, so pollinator food, I go to all the city meetings that talk about the amount of pesticides are in the city, and I found out about three years ago that San Francisco is experiencing, has been experiencing, California has been experiencing the most severe drought on record. We've been dry for almost seven years. They declared it four years, but that was a political mover, maneuver. We have been in a drought for seven years. As a result, and you're all seeing this in the news, and this is going to happen in Europe, as a result of climate change, we, our trees are dying. So everyone in this room that's a natural beekeeper and is talking about the trees knows that if you don't have trees, you don't have much wildlife. You're not gonna have the insects, you're not gonna have the birds, you're not gonna have all of those species that we need. So the trees are dying in California. Last aerial count was last year, and there were 100 and about 10 million dead trees in the natural areas of California, that's the, that's the forest. If anybody's been to Yosemite, you can see it. It's horrifyingly scary, and everybody's seeing it. There's so much dead trees. That doesn't even include the cities and the, and the counties where there's a lot of population. It's even worse. So San Francisco has a minute tree can canopy. And let me just go back, I'm sorry. Bees forage in trees. Who here has walked by a linden tree and seen it in full bloom and being buzzed, buzzing with bees. It's totally vibrating with bees. That, in San Francisco and in any major city, trees are the source of food for pollinators and birds because if you flatten out a tree canopy, you flatten it out into like into an architectural drawing, you get like almost a half block of food, of nutrition, and then you've got a different tree down the block and a different tree down the block from there, and then you, you're building diversity. So this is what I do. I want trees that are diverse, that are good nutrition, that flower for much of the year, because that's the kind of weather we have, lucky. And, um, and what I found about three years ago was that San Francisco's gonna start mowing, it's gonna start clear cutting its tree canopy, because trees are dying, they're becoming a liability, they're falling on cars and people, and they're getting old, they need to come down. But what they're doing is replacing those trees with 55, so they're, they're taking out about 20,000 trees and they're putting in about 55,000 new saplings in a drought, in climate change, without a water plan. So that's my town, who is supposed to be thinking about these things and putting a lot of money and effort into biodiversity and the natural world. So it's almost gonna be worse pretty much everywhere else where there is no policy. Like we have a biodiversity department in the city. Anyway, I found out, I did a little research and found out that almost 75% of the trees that they're gonna be planting in my town are pre-treated with systemic pesticides, neonics, and fungicides. Oh. <laughs> okay, so that response tells me that you guys know so why should you care about neonics and trees? Neonics are thousands of times stronger and more, I'm sorry, more toxic than DDT, okay? They're in every system of the plant and dispersed in the nectar, pollen, and gutation. Who knows what gutation is? No. Go. What is it? No, say so. It's basically what the plant is sweating out in the morning, so in the morning, 
So it's the morning, it looks like morning dew, but it's really a uh, liquid that oozes out of the ends of leaves that much wildlife takes the sip of. Mm -hmm. The gatation that comes out of a neonic treated uh, plant or tree, and I'm just gonna call trees, I don't wanna talk about plants, I wanna talk about trees. Those, that gutation is the most toxic that comes out. It's even more toxic than the pollen and the nectar. It's like they took a little sip of fresh poison. It never washes off. Neonics and, and fungicides that are systemic do not wash off, which a lot of people think. They are long lasting and don't degrade in the plant system for years. And they often last the life of the plant. And, and what I've talked about with researchers is that they last, the last test said that they're still showing up six, um, six years later. Fungicides, there was just a study at the University of Bologna that said that uh, add fungicides to neonics in a box of bees and the power of the neonics is enhanced. So something that's already thousands of times stronger than DDT is now even stronger to the pollinator. And we're just talking about honeybees here, right? But the truth is, is that these bees, um, that the studies don't include pollinators that are not being studied as to the effects of, of chemicals in their systems. So that's butterflies and bumblebees. Nobody's even counting how much they're eating and, and what's, what it's doing to them. Um, Okay, I said that, I said that. Yeah, so the trees that they're planting in, in my town are all going to be flowering trees. These are not fruit trees or nut trees. These are trees that are going to provide beauty and flowers that are attractive to pollinators. Bayer, who makes imidacloprid, says 20 parts per billion uh, in pollen and nectar is enough to kill honeybees. So Friends of the Earth did a study uh, two years ago now and sampled some trees in the Bay Area. An acacia they uh, tested was found at 25 parts per billion. Now remember, Bayer says, who makes this poison, says that uh, 20 is enough to kill a bee. The next tree they tested had 44 parts per billion. The crepe myrtle had 860 parts per billion. That tree will never be safe food. That's, that tree is deadly on flyby. So our system in the United States, our agricultural system is completely corrupted. Everybody can see it. Everybody can see it from over here. People in the United States have a very hard time seeing it because we trust our institutions. We have a blind trust that says, somebody up there is gonna take care of us. The regulators are watching out for us. And if anything is happening as a result of this new administration we have, it's showing us that we cannot trust our regulators, that our protections are empty, that there's none, that the whole thing is run by these industries that are poisoning the planet, the whole thing. That means that if bees are dying of it and pollinator life system and our water system and our soil and our microbes and our earthworms are dying of it, because they are, we are too, and I know that I am full of Roundup. I know we, we all are in the United States. So it's almost like a dumping ground. Yeah. Oh, God, I'm so mad. <laughs> I'm so mad. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. In order to attain an abuse of power this big, there are, it's amazing to me how many beekeepers and bee academics in the United States work hand in hand, hand in hand with the pesticide industry. And I go to so many meetings and I'm the only one that speaks up ever against these guys. It's just a bunch of guys in the room and me. And what I understand is that the beekeeper message that everybody around the world gets, mites, right? Problem number one, it's a deflection tactic. These guys are criminal. They took their practices and their narrative straight out of the playbook of the tobacco industry. To create something this big, you've gotta have a diversion. I'm gonna say this once, mites are a problem, but they're a symptom of these animals having to eat poison all the time. 
So what the beekeeping uh, industry does, the commercial beekeeping industry, is it protects the, the agricultural system that we have in California. I don't know what everybody else has, but we have a system that has a very, uh, a ton of money that goes into almonds, citrus, and the wine industry. Now grapes are not necessarily, they're not pollinated by um, honeybees, so they're not really a, a problem that I'm gonna deal with, but they all use a lot of chemicals. And the um, industries that's, that need beekeepers to bring their bees in are the ones that control our politics. I go to Sacramento to the Department of Food and Ag meetings, and these committee members are just happy to be hand in hand with the pesticide industry. It's unbelievable. I went to a, um, I was trying to get a bill passed. I was working with Pe uh, Pesticide Action Network and Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace and the American Bird Conservancy. There was like me and two other beekeepers there. That was it. So this bill would have done two simple things. It was a really simple labeling bill. It would have labeled every plant grown in California that was treated with imidacloprid, just one neonic, every plant would have to have a label. So that was the number one part of the bill. The second part of the bill would have prevented the general public from going into a garden center and buying these poisons, because anybody can. And the problem with people, they think if a little is good, a lot is better. And they use so much. This is gold to these industries. They're making so much money from the general public, so of course, they came out in force in opposition to this bill. And this happened twice over the last over the last several years. And guess who killed that bill in committee? It didn't even get to the floor. California State Beekeepers Association showed up. There it is. <coughs> That's them on the bottom. In opposition to this bill, again, a simple labeling bill informing people that those plants that you're buying for pollinators for your garden are treated with the poisons that kill pollinators that are being banned in Europe. That's who they voted with. They voted with Bayer, they voted with the real estate, and don't get me going about real estate in San Francisco. Talk about crime. Um, and then all of these other industries, and that's the pesticide industry lobbying wing, is the California State uh, Beekeepers Association. They do this all the time. They're constantly working for the almond industry, the most unsustainable <laughs> industry probably on the planet. It enriches a very few people, and it causes unbelievable, unrecoverable amounts of damage agriculturally. Okay, I don't need to tell you about, um, cal about how beekeepers do their work, and we don't have to talk about that. That's it. Um, so, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Because, you know, I'm, I don't have anything in my pockets, basically, so. Um, it's such an honor to be here, really, and I'm so scared, because I thought it would be in the smaller room, and I was like, okay, is it real? Is it really happening right now? Well, you know, I've, I've been talking uh, earlier this day, and I don't want to repeat myself, and uh, yeah, and I really, came up with some provocative thesis that I hope no one is going to attack me because I would have to jump over the window. I've checked it out. I can do this. And, uh, so it's a little bit philosophical. It's not really, it's not 100% based on scientific research. It's more about my impressions and what I've found out in the last 12 years of my research. My name is Torben Schiffer, I'm working for Jürgen Charles and the Hobbes Project and I've, uh, I've been studying honeybees since 12 years now and I'm the sort of scorpion man. So if, you, if you're reading something about book scorpions, it's highly likely 
I have my fingers in that. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, what are solar so I'm American. Okay. Yeah, I know. Oh yeah, we don't know about this insect. Okay, that that is a okay, this one. And it has an ant size and uh, it's feeding on varroa mice and it once lived in every beehive. Oh the V the V um Okay. Oh sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I finished and the bill is too high, I will I will come around and please help me to pay it, okay? So um yeah, so please don't have a go. I mean, let me explain, okay? So don't be too shocked, please. So okay. Um so it is topic why we are killing what we love. And um first of all I want to compare the natural conditions that I've observed in, in hives, in nature, um, and compare it to the managed hives, because that will explain a lot. And um, then I, I would tell you that bees have a right to die, and that the biggest enemy of bees is the modern way of beekeeping itself. I've written an article about that, and uh, Man, I got a lot of feedback. <laughs> it was the first day it had like over 20,000 readers and uh, and most of them were shocking. I mean, giving feedback like I didn't really like it. But, uh, but some of them was quite good and they understood what I meant. And it is, of course, a provocative headline, but I wanted the people to get to read it. And the uh, the you know, the guy in charge of the Beekeeping Research Institute in Zellet had published, Werner von der Ohe, had published another article one week earlier. It said, as long as we have beekeepers, we will have bees. And I felt like, well, this is gossip, because if you don't have any bees anymore, you wouldn't have beekeepers. So turn it that way around. It doesn't make any sense. So I said, okay, I gotta come up with another headline. And I came up with this one. And it really, it really hit the nail on the head. And I will tell you about that text a little bit. And then the last thing I want to say is that every one of us can make a change. So if I, I had a nice analogy that I came up at the breakfast that the guys who attended my other speech already know, but I really love it. And um, that was when we are doing research on bees that were keeping in hives that are made bars and that are so different um, from the conditions that we find in tree cavities, then it is like being in a zoo and studying an elephant and writing a book about his natural behavior. And when we do this, we'll come to the conclusion that it likes bananas and it likes being fed by children with apples and bread. And if you place then these children in the wilderness in Africa and let them try that, they'd probably be faced with another truth. So, I will tell you about that truth. When we have managed hives, when you have hives in cavities, we have a problem because there is very little space. So, the mites, or the, no, the MVM cannot develop as well as in the uh, Men's size. And uh, it starts in the early year, of course. The bees will develop a brood field, then they collect honey, and then there's a problem where to take in the honey if there's no beekeeper adding space. So, what they do is then they decrease the brood field, it's, it's shrinking. And then the swarms will get up. And the swarms will take out like 15 to 20 percent of the mites. That's not very much, basically. But then we have a brood pause of about four weeks. And what happens then is the mites, they get infertile. They physiological change. 
is something that Ralf Büchler has done research on in the Bienen Forschungsinstitut in Kirchheim in Germany. And I've listened to his speech recently and I was like, oh, what really? And I gotta tell you this. So they cannot reproduce. They will, after four weeks, go into the cells, try it, but they can't reproduce. So it'll take another four weeks for them to get into the fertilized phase again. So we have eight weeks where they cannot reproduce. Um, in that eight weeks, every day, we lose 1% of the mite population. From natural death, being bitten off, being carried out, bees not coming home. So that will mean if 20% went off with a swarm, and we have another 55, 56% dying in the period of non-reproduction, we will naturally lose like 76 up to 80% of the mite population in that natural process. What do we do in the managed hives? If the hive is full, we add another box. Then we add another box, or we take away the honey. So the bees keep on producing. And we have a massive field of brood. So by that huge amount of brood, we will have a massive reproduction of VM. And that is basically caused by us. At the end of the summer, we then use chemistry to fight the problem that we have created with our deeds. And uh, that's totally different um, to, the, yeah, to the things that we find in nature. So we got to consider it. And it's, it's the idea with the zoo. We have been taught that we have to do it like this. We even hinder swarms to get off. We don't have that brute pause at all. We split the hives, we make the decisions, and we make the decision whether a colony is life worthy or will kill the queen because it's lazy. If I look at lazy hives and I look what they do, I find that they, I've never seen a lazy hive. If they don't produce as much, they are highly likely uh, busy with something else. And we gotta understand this. Any behavior that we breed on the bees by, you know, making the decision which one is uh, life worthy and which isn't, every, everything that we want costs something. If bees have to carry like 50 kilos plus, it takes them thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of work to do that. These hours they cannot spend on hygienic behavior, for example. So, we have learned to deal with the bees like that, but is it really the truth? Are we sitting in a zoo and looking at an elephant and believe that's nature? Or shouldn't we first go into nature and look what we find there? As no, to me, it's no wonder that we wonder why the bees in nature survive. But, I mean, there are reasons for that. And we're standing at the beginning of that understanding. We didn't really get it. And as long as we place them on the, on this, you know, on the meadow with a mesh bottom, directly on the soil, which is always wet, we have mold on the honeycombs, and many other things that I've already referred to, we should ask ourselves, have we done our best to, to have healthy bees? Have we done, is it just to do it? Can we get all the honey out, you know? If we have moldering combs, which would, you would never find in tree cavities, and we could prove that the bees are infected with a mold, and we then take out the honey and uh, undermine the immune system, undermine the metabolism, that means that the mold is going to destroy cells, but the body of the bee cannot replace these cells because there are no ingredients to build new cells. Then who wonders that they die? Who of you would survive it to eat moldering sugar water for six months and to live in 14 degrees with a humidity of 90%, not going out, no one of us. But the bees, they do. It's magic. If we then 
Think of a live and let die project. Put the bees in these improper hives, put them on the meadow, and say, okay, we're gonna do live and let die. They are highly infected with mold spores. Then they are infected with bacteria and viruses. So what good is this for? If we have big losses and we see it's not gonna work. On the other hand, we see in Wales, there's so many brilliant beekeepers treatment free. And they all say, you gotta, um, you gotta make sure that the warm energy is not going out. You gotta insulate your hives. Many of them from, you know, came to me and said, yeah, you gotta do something about this. Oh, but I have two minutes left. Oh, well, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> happened, to me, <laughs> happened to me again now. <laughs> so, <clears throat> bees have a right to die. That means if, if we choose the genetic code, if we choose that they have to have a certain behavior that costs their natural behavior, that, that uh, provides them with a stability to survive in nature, we are to blame. We need to think about our deeds. And if a colony dies, it's not a loss. You know, it's, it's the basic rule of nature that a parental generation produces many offsprings and they differ in certain, in certain conditions and only nature is able to check on them whether all their abilities are fitting or not. That's survival of the fittest. If they're not fitting, they need to die. It's a natural process. If they're not dying, we wouldn't have any evolution. We are sitting here because of that fact. But we wouldn't let them die. And we have a law in Germany that prevents let our bees die because we have to treat them with acid, even those who were incapable or not able to survive on their own. So there is a big problem that I would like to elaborate, but I don't have any time anymore. <laughs> so, and that is why the biggest enemy of the bee is the beekeeping itself. If you want to know more about this, just read it in the internet. I've published an article about it. Type in my name, type in that title, and you'll find it. And if you hate me afterwards, send me an email, tell me about it. I really would like to know about your thoughts on it. I really want to know, I want to have feedback. Don't swear at me, I, I didn't, to you. But please give me a feedback of this. And last but not least, I would just like to say that any one of us can make a change. When I go out home and I look at fields that are treated with glyphosate and I see until the horizon there is nothing alive. Yeah. It's not a single flower. And even I don't dare to dig in that soil because I feel I might lose my fingers. But I can tell that there's not much life in these fields. And a few weeks later, there's corn on it. And we all eat our bread with it. I have glyphosate in my blood. They didn't ask me if I wanted it. I don't. I don't appreciate it. But we can choose because we pay for it. We are the ones who are financing it. If you eat it, you'll pay them for doing it. So don't do it. Okay, thank you very much. Bring up um, uh, oh, car, meet. car meet again. Um, and just really, she's just got something really brief to say uh, about truth. Okay. Um, so Torben, you say that we have the right to choose and um, it's true that we have the right to choose, but what, where do we take, where do we make our choices from? Um, I would like to read you a quote by an American environmental lawyer. Uh, his name is Gus Speth, and um, I think this speaks very much to what we are speaking about this evening. So I'll just read it to you. It's, he says, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. Yes. 
And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And I think that um, when, when Terry spoke to me about this evening about um, earth activists and, you know, we have, um, we are all very different. We all have different skill sets and we are all earth activists. So we all approach it in different ways. Um, we, the legal system is a very important uh, part of it and uh, speaking to the pesticide industry is a very important part of it, but how, on top of that, how do we make choices which are not coming from greed and selfishness? Because I don't know about you, but I certainly can be greedy and selfish at times. Uh, I have that in me. And I need to work with myself um, to find ways to think differently. And not only to think differently for myself, but also to think differently with my community and to work together with my community to take different decisions, to yeah, to approach things and to, to imagine things, how things can be different because we've built our systems on certain premises and these certain pre premises are human centric, are selfish for what we want and what we need. And Jenny said today very beautifully that the bees know what to do, they can take care of themselves, but it's, it's us and Torben, you've said that as well. And it, it is very clear that what we are doing is coming out of who we are. Um, so what is, you know, this is a question I would like to raise and just to further, for the conversation later, what is a cultural transformation? What does that mean and how can we do it? Okay. Um, Heather is... Uh <laughs> So Heather's going to come up and put a point on that, and then um, what I wanted to do, if it's okay with you guys, is just invite you to speak about your experiences. I know we've all been intimidated and bullied by the commercial beekeeping industry in all of our various countries, you know, because we're trying to do something that we know is natural, and they're doing something that is completely unnatural. And so the unnatural beekeeping um, industry is really telling us what to do all the time. And I was wondering, is that okay with you guys to, are, is anybody interested in talking? Or do you want us just to talk? Where did she go? Oh, she's there. Oh. She, Polly's still here, right? <laughs> Polly? Yes. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, so what I was thinking, and I'm open to anybody, anybody, I want Heather to speak, and then I want um, um, Jenny and, and all the group to just kind of, Maybe we'll sit on the stage, bring Polly back. You don't have to ask all of us questions. And if you want to ask a question of anyone, you can point it at us. We don't have to all answer the same question. I want this to be about your experience. What, Heidi? I would like to ask Polly um, whether she can help us in instances where conservation... She can. Yeah, Polly, we talked about that the other day. That. Yeah, yeah, she's... hugely important. Yeah, and that's the thing. For the wild, we're going to support the wild people. And if Polly can help us, and we want every single person in this room to sign up to be to join uh, Polly's <coughs> yeah. Okay, so for those who couldn't hear, Heidi was saying she wants everybody to sign up on Polly's thing. And the thing is, we go to the. <laughs> <laughs> We, we as a group, we go to the pesticide industry, I'm sorry, to the conventional beekeeping industry as a go-to for our source, and we trust what they're speaking about will serve bees, and that's not the truth. We have to go outside of that community, because it's not really our community. They don't speak for us. Let's go outside of it and, and, and encompass all the other people that are already making a difference, the water people, the bird people, the people that care about butterflies, soil, everything like that, organic food, organic growers, permaculture. There's so many different people that support our cause. It is not the industrial food system of this planet. That does not support pollinators. Sorry. Would you guys rather have this conversation that she's inviting you to have? Because I'm happy to not talk. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, so the one, the one thing I would say really quickly, I'm going to keep this. Um, speak closer. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to speak really quickly. Um, and I have, I have a little timer for myself, so I won't go quickly or too fast. But um, I know everyone said slow down when I, when I was talking before, so I'll try to 
keep it short, but also speak more slowly. Okay. Uh, the thing about cultural change, um, I'm. Inc I feel very much uh, like I think about the same things that uh, Terry thinks about all the time. Um, one of the things I want to say, just as a personal note, is that um, uh, one of the uh, big problems with farm workers that work with pesticides is they get Parkinson's disease. My dad has Parkinson's disease, and, um, and possibly because he was poisoned. But the thing I would say is that watching my father uh, suffer through that disease with great grace and incredible resilience, but it, it's a disease that is, uh, it's, it, it um, destroys the body very slowly and there's nothing to do about it. There's, it, there's really no, there's no hope. Um, and um, I was uh, talking earlier with Tom about how uh, part of the reason that I can have so much empathy for the insects that are, that are ingesting neurotoxins is because I live with my dad, who, who is uh, suffering from a neurological disease. Um, so this is a very, very big issue to me as well. The thing I think is that when I tell people, uh, and I work mostly, as, I've, as you know now, uh, with students um, and people like my neighbors, um, when I start talking about you know, a big, these big problems, they can't, there's no place for them to enter in with any kind of hope or strategy. So my job, I feel, because I'm, uh, I have this ability to write words down, and uh, <laughs> we can say whether or not that's any, any good, but, um, but what I think about is I want to narrate the stories that are uh, alternatives to, to this, this system that we have that's obviously not working. And I just want to tell you really quickly three things that are really fantastic and good, and they're happening all over the place. And, um, and they're in, in response to, uh, to this industrial agricultural model. Um, uh, it, it's not necessarily even a response, but it's a, it's a really different m model. And that is one, um, urban farmers are doing amazing things. They're taking vacant lots and they're, they're feeding people um, that are living in food deserts that don't have any, uh, they really have, they can get liquor faster than they can get any kind of food that's fresh. Um, you see it in Detroit, Milwaukee. Um, I'm sure it's happening in San Francisco. Um, there's an incredible story about a guy in LA who um, started breaking laws by, by uh, <laughs> planting vegetables right along the street in the, it, it, you know, in the in the little median. He got in a bunch of trouble, but the world found out about it through social media, and there was such an outrage that he got in trouble for this that they now passed a law in LA that says that you can plant vegetables. On, next to the sidewalk in any place in the city. And that's because one guy yeah. broke the rules and Woo! said, look, you know what, I want fresh vegetables, I want organic food. And he's living in, right, he's living in an area that is known for its drug addiction, uh, its crime. Uh, he's an African-American man and, and there's a, I mean, there's a whole, he said, he said that when he goes into poverty-stricken areas, most of the time, there are people of color, they're lower income, and they don't have anything to eat. And he said, I want to change that. And he is changing it. He's making that happen. And that's happening in Detroit, it's happening in Chicago, it's happening in Milwaukee. Another thing that's happening is that, <clears throat> am I okay, can I talk for two, two more minutes? Yep. Really quickly, one of the things that's really hard about going against the, the industrial farming model is that if you want to, uh, in the United States, is that if you want to have crop insurance, you have to follow the model um, that says, if I say to Matthias, ah, I see this pest, uh, I see this pest right here, you better treat it. And if Matthias doesn't treat it with a pesticide, he w and loses his crop for any other reason, he doesn't get any money. So the insurance companies make sure that they have to use the pesticides. So the thing is that when someone says, I want to be an organic farmer, they have to say, I'm going to have to find those insurance companies that will give, uh, you know, that will insure organic uh, farms. Luckily, there are some insurance companies that are realizing that that's going to be a good idea. So this is happening. This is shifting. But it's been very hard. The thing I will say is that there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of young farmers. I mean, I just uh, about a month ago was invited out to this uh, to this farm as a young couple. Um, and they said, we'd like you to come out and have dinner with a bunch of strangers at our farm and we're going to talk about bees. And uh, I said, okay, that sounds great. Um, so I got out there and what they had done is they purchased this property, they took out all the soybeans that were there and they planted it with um, 
there's, there's all wildflowers and uh, new kinds of ground cover in these different areas. They planted fruit trees. They have all these tables set up in their yard. And what they're doing is they're inviting the community out to have a conversation. So they feed them fresh mm -hmm. food and they don't even know them. They just put out a message to the community. They said, come to our farm. So I sat here with all of these people they, they, who had never been to this farm. We were all sitting there. There were school teachers and uh, people, a janitor. And we were all sitting there talking. And it was about community and coming together. And suddenly we were talking about bees. And they were saying, oh, so what do we do you know, you know, in, our, in our own yards? What should we do? You know, plant flowers and stop pouring the pesticides on your lawn. And they're like, oh, wow. So the thing I think is that we need to have this awareness. I think that from my side, I feel like I want to say, there are so many hopeful narratives that we can tell, that we can repeat, that we can share with people, that will inspire them and not feel, make them feel so powerless. And I don't. And this is not to say that all of that work that needs to be done with changing the laws, it does. It's depressing. I, it's depressing. I'm sure it's depressing. Yeah. I, and I feel like the thing about changing the culture is that one mind at a time, one neighbor at a time, you take them to your bees, you feed them some honey, and then you, you, know, you could get into the thing and say, you know what? Maybe that lawn chemical, it's making it hard for my bees. Maybe you could stop using it, right? I mean, it's so hard for us to be that kind of, to have that kind of honesty. But to tell these stories of hope, I think, is part of, uh, part of the resistance and part of the new narrative. And so I'll stop talking now so someone else can. <laughs> <laughs> Get on stage, or and then I'm going to just start passing the mic. Okay. Um, I keep bees in the UK, and I just like to say I don't believe in conventional beekeeping at all. However, the people I meet who are conventional beekeepers do not necessarily, perhaps they're naive. They do not understand the problems that are out there that are making things worse. So I think really, if you can convince them more, not just saying that their beekeeping is totally wrong, but to actually have reasons why, you might find that is a, a better way than, I believe in sort of gentle persuasion rather than battering someone over the head with something. And there's also, there's a lot of people that are changing, like there's a lot of conventional beekeepers that are saying no more. There's somebody here from Sweden I was talking to today and she had hundreds of hundreds of hives and just stopped uh, because saw that it wasn't serving. And that's happening. The world is turning. Everybody is seeing differently because of the, the kind of world that we have. But does anybody have any uh, questions for uh, Polly or any other, pro any other issues where you've experienced something that you wanted to change? Um, <laughs> Thank you. Just a uh, more um, explanation because I think that uh, I discovered the, the situation in the US is horrible, <laughs> it's clear. But you have to know that uh, at the European level, I think we have to, you have to know that a lot of beekeeping associations, they, they group themselves to create a bee life. Bee life is an association with working against the neonics, all the pesticides we are working on, fungicide. Perhaps you, you must know this association there. And we do a, a splendid job it's with the, their work that we can arrive to push to the Commission to, to analyze the dossier of uh, the neonics. And so it's on this base that they, we can change the situation here in Europe. It's due only with the beekeeper. Without the beekeeper, nobody talk about this. So it's, you have to know this. And it's all the beekeeper, not only the natural beekeeping, it's all the beekeeper who are concerned by this. One thing is very important, it's to we have to change. Today we know that the agricultural model is the key for our bees, all the insects. It's very important and we have to, to, to struggle and to push all the authorities to, to arrive to change the model of, bee, of uh, farming. It's impossible to continue with this farming system. We have to change and it's completely urgent. And we need everybody in all the country, all the European, uh, the European country know they will have to decide if we can use the pollinator as indicator to, to, to give money for the farmers. We have to arrive to this point. Because if the farmers are linked to the pollinator, uh, or to the well-being of the pollinator to, to be fi financed, this will change the situation, I think. So we have to, 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 to find some union 
for all the beekeeper everywhere in Europe. And if you can arrive to the same situation in the US, it will be perfect. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Beekeepers could be such a power, such a force. Can I ask you, Polly, do you think that, um, God, I feel like Oprah. Um, do you, do you, Polly, do you think that in, in part of an ecocide law, um, something like this, uh, how would it, would it define, um, have you given any thought to natural beekeeping practice as opposed to conventional beekeeping practice? They're the ones who create the law that make it, you know, that keep the narrative in place. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it, 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 ecocide law uh, addresses the source of the problem. So if you have anything that's causing serious harm, any dangerous industrial activity, that can be shown evidentially is causing harm, extensive damage, destruction to or loss of ecosystems, then it becomes prohibited. So what you're looking at is closing the door to the dangerous industrial activities that are having adverse impact on bees, pollinators, how we actually connect with uh, natural systems. Now, instead of creating little laws that identify, for instance, um, banning neonicotinoids, Ecoside doesn't do that. It actually says, first do no harm. So that means neonicotinoids are automatically out of the window. Glyphosate is automatically out of the window. I, you can list a whole raft of different insects, insecticides, pesticides that suddenly become prohibited because of this. It fundamentally changes at the very outset what is allowed to be used for industrialized agriculture. So the impact for pollinators is enormous. Instead of overstressed systems which are killing them, the terminators of the bees, instead what you're having is the flourishing of the pollinators and it's the flourishing through natural means i was very taken with the talk uh, forgive me i didn't catch your name the, the gentleman uh, just earlier who was talking about the huge problem of actually insisting on keeping the bees alive which means you resort to unnatural systems this is this is actually what i'm dealing with criminal law doesn't deal with a rights-based narrative it deals with a responsibilities-based narrative, a duty of care. And it's, it's the opposite side of the coin, if you like. Uh, but the right here, what we're actually we're talking about is the right to life, is protected, for instance, our human right to life is protected by the crime of murder or homicide. Uh, if it's collectively, then we're looking at genocide. And genocide is put in place because it's the right not to kill. What ecocide does is it's essentially based on the same premise. It's, it's dealing with the responsibility, sorry, not the right not to kill, the responsibility not to kill. And it's the responsibility to ensure that the systems that are used are non-harmful. So the, the underlying premise, if you like, is first do no harm. And where you have chemicals and pesticides being used that are causing harm, and of course evidence is mounting every day to show that then that becomes prohibited. So it has a huge, significant impact right across the board, not just with one chemical, not just with one practice, but actually for the whole industrialized agricultural practices. Beautiful. What you'll find is something like Monsanto, for instance, can no longer operate the way it's operating. Some companies won't do well out of this, that's for sure. But other companies okay. may change what they're doing. And we saw this, I mean, this seems like a huge, huge issue. And sometimes it seems as if it's utterly unsolvable, but actually it's not. You know, there was once upon a time when we thought slavery was an unsolvable problem, uh, that we would never manage to abolish slavery. And indeed, so much stemmed from slavery. The sugar plantations required many slaves, for instance. But when slavery was criminalized, and that's what it took, it was the abolition of it through criminalizing, cr criminalizing it, many of the companies actually reinvented their wheels and created innovation in the other direction. And some of them indeed actually became the policers of the systems. So for instance, in the UK, Rathbones Bank, which is a private commercial, ethical private commercial bank that we have here, 
they used to build slave ships. Um, there is no correlation between building a slave ship and becoming an ethical bank, except for the fact that slavery was criminalized and they decided they were going to do something ethical about it and decided to move into the investment business instead. So you can see how different companies operate in different ways and change. Some fall by the wayside if they refuse to change what they're doing because then it's outlawed. But others will actually start creating the innovation in the other direction. And indeed those pioneers, like for instance the guys that are having the meals and inviting in the neighbours and they're starting doing their you know, organic farming, you know, they're the ones at the forefront of where this is going to go. We already have models in place that show where this is going to go in a really big way. And that's always what happens every time when you have a seismic shift in culture. And indeed, that's what it is when the, the, the raising of consciousness, if you like, the conscientious protectors, those who are very conscious of their responsibility to protect. You have the innovators out there and indeed law is just playing catch up with that. But it's a fundamental shift that happens there that happens from right across the board. It's not just one little turning over here, we ban that, we stop that. It's not enough. It's actually it's outlawing the whole practices as a whole because they are fundamentally harmful. Wow. Cool. Okay. Hi, Polly. I'm Olivia. I'm Olivia from America. Um, yesterday we had a presentation, a very nice presentation by a gentleman who um, is presenting on the unspeakable might, that one, the euro, okay. Um, and one of his sponsors for the program that he's working on was Bayer. And I was, I was taken aback for the obvious reasons, and I know many others were because they talked to me afterwards. And after that, following that conversation, I did a sort of informal survey of many people here from various European countries. Do you treat your bees? Yes or no? Yes, was the answer I got a lot, like 70% about. I was shocked. I really was shocked. And by the people that I talked to, they told me the countries that they live in, it's mandatory yeah. that they treat their bees with medication by yeah whoever. <laughs> My question is really one in two parts. The first part is the presenter, as a sponsor using Bear, will he be able to say in conjunction with the Natural Bee Trust, I did a presentation, da 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 da, -da as presented by Bear, da 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 da, I don't know, something like that. Can he join us to his, to Bear in any way? And that's perhaps a lesser point, but the major point is what can be done about these people that don't want to treat their bees, they would like to give their bees the chance of natural selection but can't by law and are afraid if they don't treat their bees that they're going to be something, punished. What can be done? Okay, break the law. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyer, I, you know, not all law is good law. I, so stand up, be a voice for the bees, be a conscientious protector, and you'll find information about this on missionlifeforce.org. We are now training up many, many activists who are prepared to break the law so that they protect the earth in whatever capacity that is, whether or not it's against fracking, beekeepers. I, I, we have people from all over the world contacting us saying, what should I do? And we're actively saying, well, do like the conscientious objectors did uh -huh. after World War I and during World War I, stand up for your conscience and stand up and speak clearly and say, I refuse to be complicit in the harm. And if that means then that I'm going to be arrested and charged and taken to court, I'm prepared to do that and we'll help you do that. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to speak um, for a moment yeah. because um, I'm a bee conservationist and so is Karen. And we found ourselves in this situation with many of you speaking about how you love the bees 
and how this is an important creature to you. I don't understand your language of love because I don't keep a wild animal in a box. Mm. And I know many of you have to because you say you've lost your wild bees in your country. I don't believe that narrative either. Who's feeding you this narrative? I heard today in, in our panel discussion that the Netherlands doesn't have any cavities in the trees. I, was, I arrived from South Africa two days before this conference. I was riding a bicycle in your one of your national parks in the north. I've got trained eyes for where wild bees want to live. There are lots of spaces. There are lots of trees. There are cavities all over the show. Who's keeping the bees out of those cavities? Are you in any way complicit in what you're doing to stop these creatures from returning to their wild places? Ask yourself that question because you need to make the paradigm shift. You need to make the paradigm shift. Stop eating their food, number one. They eat honey. That's their food. And wild bees only make what they need. We have forced them to change their nature, to make food for us. An evolved species understands what it is to live on this planet. It does not live with greed. That is our species. When you put your super on top of your bees, you are making them go into competition with other pollinators right there. They only make what they need. And you want their food. Let them be wild. Enjoy them in the wild. It's the most beautiful place to engage with them. You have to make the quantum ship in the, in the north. In the south, in South Africa, where I live in Africa, our bees are wild. And they're amazing. It's wonderful to be in their, their company. Start organizations like our volunteer organization, Comb, caretakers of mellifera bees in the wild. Watch them where they are living in the wild. Ask your conservationists why they aren't protecting them in conservation areas. If you pay money to conservation organizations and you come from a country where bees are indigenous, honeybees are indigenous, they should be protected. We spent three years in South Africa working with all our conservation bodies. The agricultural narrative will never own our wild bees. Conservation owns that narrative in South Africa because we've made sure of that. It took us three years of dedication to, to get the conservation bodies to understand the importance of the species. But you all here, you love bees. They are happiest in the wild. They are happiest in the wild. Find a way to let them go. Let them go back to those cavities in the trees. There are plenty of spaces for them. Um, so thank you to all of you. I have a, um, a nap. I have an analogous situation. I come out of the healthcare industry and have worked in pharma biotech as a neuroscientist for 20 years, and then most recently in stem cell lobbying and regenerative medicine. And so I've been really interested in this transition and this analogy from the bee community and the ecosystem-wide effects of big agriculture on the community as we've had on pharma and antimicrobial resistance on human health and the effect it has on the human internal health biome. So, is it that bad? Um, and so, in thinking about something that Terry has said and something that I have been giving thought to is also the consideration of not just how we treat the bee, but these other pollinators as an aggregate system that works toward eco ecosystem-wide health. And something that we've done in the human system is to link together various patient advocacy groups as a way to have critical mass when we are in Washington, D.C., as a way to speak to the politicians and change the laws and write the laws that are on behalf of not just one patient group, 
for hemophilia or gene therapy or leukemia. It's actually all of them. And under that umbrella, that critical mass of banding together, of involving, again, a system-wide approach to tackling the problem, I see like there is an ability for us to band with the mycologists, the climatologists, the environmentalists, the other pollinators, the orthonologists, that there are enough other groups out that, there that are also hearing this message and knowing this message on the greater ecosystem that can actually give mass to it and have that link to human health that the reason why we do this ultimately is so that we can, we can also be healthy. And then instead of thinking about the medical system as a duty of care and a standard of care, to change those standards of care by involving greater members within the community that have voice and are able to take that lobbying to Washington, at least in the United States, in order to change those laws. Because it takes a real fight and it takes real mass to do that. And as cute as Apis mellifera is, it's not just a single insect problem. It's not a pest and that all others are pests. It's a problem for all. It just takes that critical mass in order to make those arguments and make that impassioned plea to combat the selfishness, the greediness, and the apathy that unfortunately is part of the human condition. This is something I've wanted to ask everyone for a really long time. Um, it's really personal and I think that's why it's so difficult to face um, where our food is actually coming from. Um, so we accept meat and dairy into our lives freely and it is all around me. And since I was young it is so acceptable. And I just want to ask everyone if it is really worth the deforestation. Yeah. Well, I, I have a question to you, actually. Um, you see me? me? Yeah, you. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> so, you know, we have a funny situation in Germany. We have recently discovered wide living colonies, so we could prove that they are all still there. For, I mean, for many years I've been told that they have been wiped out, that they are not existent. So I would recommend, if you think they are not there, go and do beelining to try to find them. And uh, I would, it's highly likely that we will find them. So we have two contradictory laws. One is the bee disease law that is telling me that I have to use chemistry, have to uh, treat the varroa mites, have to use it, and if I don't do it, I have to pay a, f a fine or a, a, they can impose it on me by law. On the other hand, we have the natural, the federal natural protection law that says, and bees are included, even domesticized honeybees are included if they, if they swarm, they'll be under, you know, they, they'll be protected by that law. And it says, I cannot even disturb them because I would be fined up to 50,000 euros. <laughs> So now we have them in the wilderness, and, uh, and I called the vets the other day, and I said, so what kind of law is now applying to me? And they said, you know, we got to refer you to, the, to a bee research institute that I know claims that we need to use the chemistry in order to get rid of the mites. And I said, this, this ain't going to go anywhere, because they are criticizing me all the time. And um, so I prefer to refer to the law that I like most. <laughs> but uh, I'm an officer. I'm, I'm part of the government. But I call it like, you know, it's, it's, when I break the one law, I'll follow the other. So what would you recommend? <laughs> so, you know, my, my, my fear is, I just want to, I, I want to add, my fear is, because I'm, I'm continuously attacked now that I'm telling people about that research that I'm doing. And I have created more and more outrage. And I feel it's going to start. It's just the beginning. And I hope if we set up a project to let the bees go through the live and let die process, 
that the law is not going to change for the others. I, I mean, they could easily get rid of the honeybees in the natural protection law. I feel much easier than we to change the disease law for the bees. So I, I feel we need to be very well prepared for that battle. And I, I've been looking for an attorney or a lawyer for a long time to raise those questions. There's but one there right is, behind you. There isn't <laughs> anyone. It's right there. Right. It's right there. I can uh, you know, oh wow, you, you are literally anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that, is, that is the one I would like to ask you. And, and even though you're in the US, if I'm, if I'm in trouble, can I probably give you a call? <laughs> You know, and I just wanted to say something to uh, the yep. woman who spoke about me and the woman over there, the British woman, who suggested that it's better to... So industrial agriculture is the problem at every rate, at every scale. The way that they treat industrial animals in the industrial factories where they do meat production in the United States, the, the confined animal, I forget, they're CAFOs, I don't remember the, the letters. but. That is, that is a crime, that's horrible. It's bad for everything. The environment, the pollution, the water pollution, they're finding pollution in the Gulf of Mexico that came out of Idaho now. Industrial agricultural pollution out of these pig farms. And the thing is, commercial beekeepers are also, oh, I'm gonna get in so much trouble, are, are doing the same thing. These packages, these packages, man. The queen breeding is so cynical because beekeepers know that queens, that these systemic poisons are affecting reproduction, both drone and queen. So what do they do? They learned how to make queens, how to get queens always on the market. So if your bees die of pesticides or whatever they die of, you can get another package, you can get another queen, you're okay. And that is not addressing the problem, that's profiting from the problem. I have a problem with that. And I don't think we have time for nice anymore. They're not being nice. So, hi. And thank you. Um, yes, 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 yes. I mean, this is the most excited I've been out of any of the panels this whole weekend. So thank you to all of you. I've been thinking the same things about a bee-centric idea. It feels like if we went down that route, it would be akin <laughs> to monocropping. We would throw everything off balance because we're not giving credit and appreciation to all the supporting characters that are essential in this story called our ecosystem. Right. And without them, so what, okay, one of the things that I'm looking at it through I know you said not to be nice, but can we figure out a different way and can we have compassion while still being passionate and seeing that we're all fucking born into these systems that are overlaid on the goodness and the ability that we have to see it differently, them and us. But can we show, right? So can we show them that it's us? Right, that it's all of us, that they're not separate from us, and we are not separate from them, then we make them a part of us, and we make us a part of them, and it changes our whole outlook and our perspective, right? And they're never gonna be happy unless we're all happy. They're, they're gonna have to hoard and protect and keep their stuff, and they're gonna be afraid of us usurping them. So if we can show them that there's enough resources and that we're all a part of this, and we're all essential, and that death is an essential part of it too. But we don't have to fear that death anymore because we see it as one. And just like reforming these things in our perspectives, just as if we talked about honey as bee vomit, we're not gonna feel the same about it, but we can shift our perspectives. I'm sure I have a lot more to say, but that's all for now. Thank you. Sorry, yes, okay. I'll be very short. I just want to expand this into a more global situation. 
Uh, just a question. What do you say about the World Health Organization that declared glyphosate as a probable carcinogen and still permitted it to be sold through its outlets? That's all. Holly? I didn't hear the question properly. Uh, what do I? What is it about the World Health Organization? Uh, the World Health Organization declared glyphosate as a probable carcinogen. As a, as a carcinogen. No, as a probable carcinogen. A probable. Yes, and with such a risk factor, especially for human health, how can it permit glyphosate to still be sold on the world market? Well. The biggest problem here is because it's it's not outlawed. It's not a, a, a criminal activity to make something that still causes harm. It comes down to missing law. That's what I'm dealing with. This is the biggest problem we have. We have an awful lot of chemicals being used out there that are causing serious harm, and, but they're not outlawed. To outlaw it, you have to criminalise it. I mean, for instance, um, Agent Orange, Agent white, you know, these agents that were used during uh, the Vietnam War were lawful to use them. And it wasn't until the Environmental Modification Convention was brought in, and then it was a recognition of not just outlawing that particular Agent Orange, for instance, because if you just name it and say that's now a criminal uh, chemical to use, then what would happen is you just reinvent it under another name. Instead, what it was, was that was recognised was that it was anything that was using chemical agents over a certain size duration impact must be outlawed. Sadly, what happened was that's only applying during wartime, is that then it was reconfigured so you could use it during peacetime for agriculture. We now know what these significant adverse impacts are but it's not a crime. So it comes down to the same thing. Yes, you have the World Health Organization out there saying it's a possible or probable carcinogen. But until you can actually bring a criminal case and definitively show evidence that it is harm and you have a ruling to that effect, not much can happen to prevent it. And this is the problem that we have. And you've actually hit the nail on the head. That's a very good example of how an industry can continue regardless. Now, any given country may decide to ban it themselves, but if they don't actually make it a crime to use it, you're still in a position where you're dealing with catch me if you can laws, where you actually have individuals having to sue companies to prevent something being used. So this is the difference between civil law and criminal law. At the moment, any aspect that you are trying to fight, it may well be through civil law. And that's why I do say, you know, don't, if you don't agree with the law, if you think that it is causing harm, well, break the law. You know, stand up and use your opportunity in court as an activist to demonstrate where your conscience is on this issue and be informed about it. Use it to bring evidence and use it to take it through criminal courts to say this should be a crime. Because if you're not criminalising it, then unfortunately you're just left with very expensive litigation at the end of the day, which most communities either can't afford, or even if they do afford it, it takes an awful lot of effort, an awful lot of money. And even if you have a ruling against a company in civil courts, it doesn't stop them from continuing with the practice. And that's your biggest problem. So. I'm afraid until it's actually recognised to be a criminal activity, you're kind of chasing your tail legally. And that's one of that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I, I may sound as if I'm kind of banging the same drum here, but it, it's ultimately what happens time and time again is that communities think, hurrah, we've actually managed to stop something, but it pops up elsewhere. Fracking is a very good example of that communities in America and Australia and now in the UK trying to fight against it, activists on the front line standing up, acting on their conscience as conscientious protectors and that's who we're helping go through the courts and that gentleman on the panel who spoke earlier, absolutely I'll help you 100%, stand on your conscience. Ask <laughs> Polly, 
Um, I'm Heidi Harman. I'm, I'm part of the organizing team of this conference. I'm, I'm a trustee of the Natural Beekeeping Trust, and I want to thank you personally for joining us here. This has been phenomenal. We would have loved to have you here in person, and maybe if we have another bee conference, we'll have it in England, and then maybe then you can be here in person. Um, so I wanted to just bring things back now to Mission Life Force, because from what I understand, and the reason why I was keen to have you involved here, <laughs> is that we could tell these 300 people, and I have to tell you, they are not conventional beekeepers, they are not honey robbers, a lot of them are people who want to get the bees back into the trees. And if they don't find natural habitat in trees, these people are putting log hives with tremendous manpower high up in trees, and they invariably get occupied by bees. And we have a lot of people of that nature here who are doing that kind of work, and others are inspired by them, and they want to do that kind of work. So these are real bee people. They are not beekeepers. And I feel that if you tell us a little bit about Mission Life Force and how every single one of us can become an earth protector and support this incredibly important work, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need a new organization to help us protect the bees in their habitat. You're actually, you're going for the thing that we all want, I feel, and therefore it would be great if we could finish by Polly explaining that for 10 quid, I understand, I'm, I'm, I'm an earth protector with Polly's organization, and I would encourage you um, to think about it because it is um, when you identify a cause that's going in the right direction and will help the earth about which we all care and will help the trees that we want to grow again so that our bees can live in them and will help ultimately with the bees. Plus, she's promised to help Torben. <laughs> Torben. <laughs> Torben is going to revolutionize the beekeeping scene in Germany. He, he will need her help. Be, uh, we want him to be alive. So please listen to Polly now about Mission Life Force and becoming an Earth Protector. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. We must meet when I'm back in England and I, I'll come up to Stroud and we'll meet. We'll Definitely. That. that would be wonderful. Yeah. Please do. Thank you, Polly. Well, and of course, Stroud is a very ecological town in the UK. Exactly. I love living here. And I so, it, in a nutshell, uh, Mission Life Force. Mission Life Force. <laughs> in case you haven't seen it yet. I, it's a campaign that we set up last November where we, we recognised that if we could bring earth protectors from across the world together, to essentially crowdfund putting in place the law that we require to protect the earth, then we can make it happen. Now, there are key countries that we've identified can actually take this forward. The countries that most require ecocide law tend to be the countries that are on the front line of climate change. So they tend to be small island developing states the little tiny nations, the little dots, you know, around the equatorial belt, uh, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, Samoa, you know, these tiny little places, not just in the Pacific, but also in the Caribbean, that actually have, in America, in politics, you talk about swing states, those uh, states that when it comes to voting time, actually hold a lot of power to swing where politics goes. Well, it's the same thing with these small islands. They actually have a huge amount of power to take ecocide crime forward. Because this is the thing, ecocide crime is not just ecological ecocide, which is driven by commercial activity. It's also climate ecocide. Climate ecocide is exacerbated by commercial ecocide. So the dangerous industrial activity by the carbon majors, as they're known, the, the main companies, big transnational corporations in the world, and industrialized agriculture is part, is part of that, are the ones that are aggravating and exacerbating climate change the most. They are the car known as the carbon majors. So those small countries that are on the front line of climate change with rising sea levels, tsunamis, floods, they have the least amount of money to even pay to get a seat at the table in The Hague to present this law. But we do. 
To bring a team from one of those countries costs around 50,000 euros each time. That's impossible for one of those countries. But for us as civil society who care and actually believe that we have a responsibility to protect, we can help finance them. And that's why we set up Mission Life Force. And in a way, it's also it's about our own life force. What do I choose to do with my life in my time? How do I use that energy constructively to create a better world? I'm greatly inspired by, and I'm really sorry, I don't know your name. You spoke about the wild bees in South Africa. That's so exciting for me. That's exactly right. This is exactly what we should be doing, looking so much more expansively, creating the enabling conditions so that nature can thrive in the wild once again. And one of those enabling conditions is actually to put in place a law that first and foremost puts the premise of first do no harm. So I'm inviting you all as earth protectors, all as bee prote protectors to come on board and sign up and help us fund this one law that can really change the world. But also it's more than that because we really want to harness the power of civil society as a movement and social media to really ensure that this law is not compromised as it moves forward. That's very important. So that ecocide can stand up there as, as genocide already is and war crimes, crimes against humanity without being lobbied into a complete compromise. And we know we can do that. We know how to do it. The law has already been drafted. You'll find a lot of information on the website. There's even an information portal called eradicatingecocide.com, which will link you through to find out more about the law itself. We're already working with a number of countries, these small island developing states that want to take it forward. So this is really, it's a kind of epic David and Goliath challenge, if you like. But this is one thing I do know. Together, we are unstoppable. Absolutely. Like the bees. We can, we can be like the bees. We can swarm us. Thank you, Polly. Is this on? No. Okay. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here. Um, and I think we have to wrap it up. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Who's telling me to stop? OK. Um, I wanted to uh, just say one thing in, in, in <laughs> ending, is that it's about legacy at this point. And our, sh our, brief, our brief human history, you know, we've managed to decimate billions of years of evolution in just a couple hundred years. Our brief, our brief human history, at this point, I think it's so important to think about legacy. What are you going to do next? Where do you want to be when all of it, you know, comes to a head? And I just think that legacy is a great way to think about whatever you do next. And that's it. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thank you very much.